Hi. Last week, we covered how ionic movements enable neurons to generate their resting membrane potential and spikes. In this video, we're going to talk about how neurons signal to each other, starting from our single neuron diagram. Inputs of the neurons' dendrites cause sodium channels to open, and following their concentration gradient, these ions diffuse into the cell and spread along the dendrites to the soma and the axon hillo, an area rich with voltage-gated channels. Low amounts of input won't raise the membrane potential enough to trigger the opening of these channels, remember the gate threshold from last time, but large amounts of input may, in which case more sodium will flow into the neuron and then begin to diffuse down the axon. However, without any help, this signal would just dissipate as it travelled the length of the axon. So how do neurons prevent this? The solution is to insulate the axon using a fatty substance called myelin. However, even insulating the whole length may not be enough. So instead, there are insulated blocks separated by gaps, known as nodes of Ranvier, which are rich in voltage-gated channels. These effectively boost the signal as it travels along the axon and generate what we call saltatory or jumping conduction. So what happens once the signal reaches the neuron's axon terminals? Well, if we zoom in on one of these terminals, we can see that this is where our neuron connects to another. We call this connection a synapse and term the neurons either side the pre- and post-synaptic neurons. These connections can be either electrical, known as gap junctions, or chemical, like this one. So what makes up a chemical synapse? The presynaptic neuron has vesicles, 3D spheres, filled with chemical messengers known as neurotransmitters. The postsynaptic neuron has proteins embedded in its membrane, known as receptors, which the neurotransmitters combine to. And then the gap between the two is known as the synaptic cleft. And while it's often drawn like a gap, there are actually proteins which reach across it and hold the entire junction together. When an action potential reaches the axon terminal, the influx of ions depolarizes the membrane and causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open and calcium to flow into the cell. This causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane and release their neurotransmitters into the cleft. The neurotransmitters then diffuse across the cleft and bind the postsynaptic receptors, triggering different effects. In the diagram here, binding causes an ion channel to open and positive ions to flow into the postsynaptic neuron, raising its membrane potential. So we would describe this as an excitatory synapse, as a presynaptic action potential will make the postsynaptic neuron more likely to fire a spike. Conversely, inhibitory synapses reduce the postsynaptic neuron's membrane potential and make spiking less likely. So how does this signal terminate? Well, some neurotransmitter molecules simply diffuse away from the cleft, some are broken down by enzymes, and some are actually taken back up into the presynaptic neuron. An interesting side note here is that there's a whole class of drugs for treating depression which work by inhibiting this sort of reuptake channel. These are known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and a common example is Prozac. Now, let's discuss neurotransmitters in more detail. Neurotransmitters are molecules synthesized by neurons, which are used to signal to other neurons. There are hundreds of known neurotransmitters which are thought to have different functions, so I'm just going to give you three common examples. Glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in vertebrate nervous systems. GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. And dopamine is often thought of as a pleasure signal, but is probably best described as signaling valence. Interestingly, individual neurons tend to contain and release multiple transmitters. For example, a single neuron may use both GABA and dopamine. Though, in general, neurons release the same set of transmitters at all of their synapses. This is known as Dale's principle and sets up an interesting contrast between biological and artificial neural networks. Again, biological neurons will release the same set of neurotransmitters for all of their partners. But in artificial neural networks, single units have both positive and negative output weights. 
So their activation sends different signals to different units. So is this a limitation of biology or an advantage? To explore this question, Jonathan Cornford and colleagues built ANNs in which each unit was either excitatory or inhibitory. This is shown on the diagram on the left in pink and blue. It turns out that these networks are difficult to train with standard gradient descent and end up performing worse than standard ANNs. You can see this on the right graph where the black curve shows the performance of a standard ANN and the green curve shows a simple implementation of networks which respect Dale's principle. So the authors introduced some corrections and were able to get networks which respect Dale's principle and match the performance of standard ANNs. This improved implementation of Dale's principle is shown on the graph as the red curve. But as the authors are only able to match standard ANNs, and as far as we know, no one has shown better results by following Dale's principle, why neurons tend to follow this principle remains an open question. OK, back to neurotransmission. Once released, neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft, bind receptors embedded in the cell membrane, and trigger different effects. There are hundreds of receptors, which are all specific to different neurotransmitters, but they fall into just two major classes. Ionotrophic receptors, shown on the top, are receptors where neurotransmitter binding triggers a change in structure, which opens an ion channel. Metabotrophic receptors are receptors where binding triggers signaling cascades within the postsynaptic neuron, which may eventually open ion channels or cause other effects. Hopefully this has given you a better idea about how synapses work. In the next video, we're going to cover how synapses can adjust their strength or weight.